I'll just give you a little background for those of you who don't know me. I'm John Herman. Uh, I farm some ground east of Haxton, six miles, and then some over uh, northwest of uh, Amherst. I farm 1,600 grand acres, it's all crop shared. I grew up working summer fowl in the tillage system. Uh, I was out there killing weeds since I was eight, ten years old. It was always fowl wheat, just like Steve said, that's all we ever had, fowl of the wheat. Um, I've been, since then, I've been in the hotel the past five years. Uh, I do have a bachelor's degree in ag economics from the University of Nebraska, and you know, I, I wish I could say I found this soil movement for soil reasons, but I, I ran into it financially because I was trying to find, when I came back to the farm and, and run numbers, I seen problems and I was trying to find better ways to, to grow more crops and more and more utilize the rainfall and acres I had. It's, and it, that's, I've seen a paradigm shift instead of, I was, when I came, first came back, I was always focused on how can I get bigger and bigger, keep doing the same thing bigger and bigger, but I've since totally changed that. And for me, I'm focusing on how do I better utilize my resources in the land that I have right now. So my first cover crop experiences in 2013, planted uh, three species mixture after wheat. It was only 20 acres, and that's that picture in the bottom right there of some radishes still in December, still green. I no longer have a rotation. I I look at my resource concerns for that particular field, and I plant a crop that that field needs. You know, I, I kind of have an idea on some of the things I can grow, but it's continually evolving. But where Steve had that picture, that hail beat, that that might totally change your rotation right there. So you gotta get something stuck in there. So you know you can't be focused on this is my rotation, this is what I'm gonna grow every year. But I do want to make sure I have something growing in every field. I have something green out there, I have some that root exuding some sort of food source for my soil biology. Right now I have some cattle on some cover crops and I started small but I got I put the whole farm in pretty quick within you know, two years, I'll have the whole farm will have had a cover crop on it. And some of those fields will have had two or three cover crops on them. You know, I, I always hear this either in town or whatever. But this is from my, my parents' house east of Haxton. This is since 1952. Um, it still rains some years, a little less than others. Some years, a little more. But for the most part, most of those numbers are between you know 12 and 22 inches. And, you know, the wind blows out here. It might snow straight down, but the next day it might be snowing sideways. So I started getting these cover crops growing and getting a living plant in the soil. And when I found out this winter, when we did get some snow, I captured all of it and then some more because the people who didn't have residue across the road or next to my field, all their snow also blew onto my field. So. I'm getting a little extra moisture. That picture on the right is, you can't see it real good, but that's 17 and a half inches on the yardstick. It's next to the road, but that continued for about 200 feet. And if I went across the road, I, I had to go into the ditch and take a measurement, it was two inches. Once I got out of that field though, I still had eight inches uniformly across that whole field. It was it was staying on my field. Those, if you can, out here in this area where water is such a limiting factor, that's huge. That if it's a dry, if it turns out to be a dry spring, moisture is a, a big issue. That extra snow catch is, is going to start moving my system forward, start it built, regenerating, and, and building on itself and, instead of going backwards. Uh, Gabe also had this in his slides, but just talking about the soil temperatures and how important those are for plant growth. So I, I'm focusing on keeping that soil cool. I gotta have good residue and I gotta have plants growing on that field to keep that soil temperature down. If, if you go out there in the summer in some of these summer fallow fields, I guarantee you in 100 degree day, those soils are 130 degrees. And if you get under there where you've got good residue, and a, a good canopy on your crop, you can substantially knock that down. Maybe you're in the, the 85 degree range, but you're, it's still better than 120, 130, where you're 
in this low rainfall area, it's all about water use efficiency. If you're not, if we're not utilizing 100% of what we're getting, then we're not, we're not efficient enough. So it's kind of embarrassing to say I did have some power this summer. I had uh, two fields, so I had about 40, 50 acres, but I planted a spring cover crop in it in March, and then I put a moisture probe in there to see how much moisture those cover crops are going to use. So there was a 12 and 24 inch profile moisture in the cover crop and a 12 and 24 inch profile in the fallow. And this was a melt stubble harvested in September. So that's on May, our previous photo was May 23rd. This is June 9th. Uh, I just sprayed that fallow already. I haven't put any uh, chemicals down on the uh, cover crop. There we are on, on June 15th. That was a uh, peas, oats, barley, uh, radish, grape mixture. So I got a, a decent amount of biomass, but I do have my soil covered. And I was out there that day spraying that field for a couple weeks before this, and I was I just kind of changed my opinion of things. I, was, I kind of woke up in the morning, what am I going to kill today? But when I was out here spraying this cover crop, I said, what am I doing out here spraying this? Um, RMA originally, to get a summer fallow designation for that, you're supposed to spray it in aggregate days before you plant wheat. They since changed that rule, so it, it's continuous crop anyway. But there's what the wheat looks like into it. You can see the moisture probe just to the right of that uh, black line in there. Try to separate it. This was in November. To me, when you look at the fallow there, that, that looks like chemical fallow looks like tillage to me. There's to me there's zero percent ground cover there. To me, that's that's unacceptable for what I'm trying to do. And even when I had that cover crop, I'm still not happy with that. I still have a decent amount of ground cover, but it's it's not enough. I, I had three or four thousand pounds of biomass on that cover crop, and by September, I mean, it's still, the majority of it is gone, but I still am holding more snow and having less wind erosion than, than the fallow did. So here's what that moisture probe shows. The cover crop is purple and green. 12 and 24 inch. So obviously that cover crop was growing, used some moisture through June, and it was sprayed in June. Do uh, you guys remember that rain in August? About two and a half inches over there, north uh, west of Amherst, anyway. And all of a sudden, my moisture profile is back to back to even. So I grew all that cover crop, and it used. The same amount of moisture as that fallow system did, and what, what did the fallow system do for my, my soil health? I didn't feed any of my soil biology, I left the ground there. And if you look at that yellow bar line there in the fallow, you know, in July when it started getting warm, I started losing a lot of the moisture that was there for evaporation. And so at the time when I drilled that wheat, I had more moisture over there than the cover And if you look where that, um, just past the 25th of August there, where that green line is, um, my, that moisture sensor updates every 30 minutes, but it actually registered on the 24 inch profile on the cover crop before it even registered in the 12 inch on the fallow. And that was about, about 30 minutes to an hour, hour difference. Just showing that, that those roots and that cover crop allowed that moisture to get down to my soil profile. So I had a similar field I planted a spring cover crop into. And then when RNA changed the guidelines, I said, well, fine, I'll just go in and plant another cover crop. So I had a spring, full season cover crop, sprayed it, it's still buying there, went in with it with another cover crop, a warm season mixture. That's the mixture on the, the right that I planted into it. Um, this was, that photo was taken about July 15th, I believe. There we are, August 29th. 
six weeks later, that sign's five foot tall. And I have a little fallow strip next to that field. So I've grown, I've grown two cover crops on this field so far. But that fallow strip next to my field, what, what did I grow on it? I haven't grown anything. So there's, there's some five and six foot tall people out there, so you can kind of get an idea that it is, that's all. You know, there we are uh, another couple weeks later, get that much more growth out of that. So I was growing wheat right next to it, and I said, well, I might as well see if I can drill some wheat into this cover crop while it's still green. I don't know what happened, but it's worth a try. It's fun when you look back and you can't see your grill. <laughs> yeah, yep. So this was last week in that same field where I drilled that weed into. So you got just where the cover crop is at on the left, and then the middle is the weed into the cover crop, and then you got the fallow weed. So that's in a straight line as well. 20 foot walking across that field. I could barely get the shovel in the wheat because it was frozen. And when I chunked it up, it was about like taking an ice cube out of a water tank, laying it over, dry. I go in over to where the wheat was, shovel sticks in easy, turns over. Pretty good moisture, a lot more moisture than I had in the fallow, in the fallow wheat. And I had even more moisture where there was just a, where there's a cover crop right now. And the shovel will push into that like butter. It was like concrete pushing into that towel. So this is a different moisture sensor. It's actually a hortel on that same field with the real tall cover crop with the towel strip next to it. So about there, August 24th, when that, if you remember the previous photo, when that cover crop was about five foot tall, probably 5,000 pounds of biomass. I grew that and a cover crop before. And it used the same moisture as that fallow strip right next to that field for about the same capacity. And from those last photos, you can see I have more moisture where that cover crop is at right now. Even though I grew all that biomass, had all that diversity out there, I utilized the moisture efficiently. And I was able to replenish it with some extra snow catch and, and better infiltration. But I was able to keep that soil covered with my cover crops. So I was able to reduce my evaporation out of the equation. John, yeah. are you going to file anymore? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that field right now. I actually had to move cows before I came here this morning. I have, that's 160 acres. I have 72 red cows on it and another 26 seven weight heifers on the other end of the field. So I, 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 we went to a field day in Bladen where Ray was at, and he said, you need to get the cows out there. So I, I don't have cows, but I have found some neighbors that did have some and were willing to let me provide the management and pasture in a way that I seen fit for my soil that was still beneficial for the cow. I'm sure Dave will go into depth about this, but I'm I'm still learning the cattle part of it. I'm moving them every, I put them on five acres, at the 72 cows, and I move them every three days. I know I need to be moving them every day and tighten that down to about an acre. But time constraints and other things traveling around, I, 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 I can't do it yet. But. So here's, here's what I'm left with. That top left photo is what they've already grazed. I'm still keeping my soil covered. That's one of my, it's one of the resource concerns. I gotta have that soil armor to protect it from wind erosion and, and the raindrop impact. And if you see that bottom right photo, that's a radish hole there in addition to front of that glove. I got a couple thousand, those cattle plucked the radish right out of the ground, so I got a couple thousand graduated cylinders per acre built into my soil right there. There they are when I'm just moving them to the, the next patch. I think it's actually a video.
They figure it out about the fourth day, and once you're ready there to move the fence, they start. Well, it ain't gonna show. Now you're all the ones who came up. World's best service site. What do you think it is? Bags of seed. That, that, that's your best service site is, is planting something. So that was taken before I was getting ready to plant stuff into my wheat stubble. 100% of my wheat acres got a cover crop. Pulled the wheat off. Cover crops right in here. Uh, that was over uh, seven, eight hundred acres, and these mixes were kind of evenly placed into that particular field based on what that field needed or, or what I wanted to achieve. These ran me about anywhere from twenty to thirty dollars an acre. But what I didn't have to do is spray. I saved two spray applications. If, you know, before I started doing this, I'd spray a volunteer weed out a couple weeks after harvest and then spray it in the fall. So I just replaced my herbicide cost with the seed cost. So I'm not spending any more money than I was before, but I'm doing, I'm doing good for my soil. You know, we, we think about the summer fallow, but you gotta look at the fallow between the crops as well. Combining the wheat, not planting corn until next spring, you got 10 or 11 months though that you don't have anything growing. That's a huge window of wasted sunlight and wasted energy that you could be putting carbon into your soil. So, this is about 12 hours after the combine left. I, I waited too long. That needs to be about an hour after the combine left. It should be running the same time that combine is going through the field. Or maybe I do have something growing in that wheat already, but after the wheat's taken off, it, it starts coming up. So this is July 18th, this is planted, and that, that's all uh, combined with the shell horn. And I got, you know, most of us have GPS, or some of you do, but I just moved my AD line over three and a half inches and planted that into the, in between the old rows of wheat, so I'm getting good seed to soil contact. And the thing about getting on this right away after you combine is that that sweet straw still has some rigidity in it and it pops right back, back up when you run the drill through. So I, I don't think the neighbors even knew I've been out there and drilled that field because it just looked like combine tracks out there. It was dry when I planted that, but you know what? Seeds aren't gonna aren't gonna grow very good in the bag, so I had to put them out there in the soil. And I was pretty scared there for a little bit, July. Well, it was about two weeks there, then rain after wheat harvest. It got pretty warm, and then I was like, oh boy, I just, I just spent a bunch of money on seed, and what am I going to get? But it, it pulled through, and so that's, that's probably a week and a half, two weeks later. It's starting to, to green up a little. There we are, another couple weeks later. I already got enough growth that that stubble is probably about uh, two, two and a half foot. So already then, I got enough growth to, to cover my, my wheat stubble already. Then we had that, remember that big downpour in August? It showed up on that uh, moisture meter. I think that was two and a half inches on there. Then that cover crop really took off. So that's August 30th, that's only six weeks later, and I got that much growth on that cover crop, and I, I didn't have to spray any herbicide. So here we are, September 10th, still green as can be, and still growing. Sunflowers are starting to flower already. I mean, they aren't putting on super big heads, but I'm providing habitat for beneficial insects and, you know, promoting food sources for the, for the pheasants and, and birds and all sorts of wildlife. That, that shovel is about waist high on me, so you know, that cover crop is already five or six foot tall in the pretty good wheat. So or, uh, I was pretty good bushel amount of wheat, but then I got this 
biomass or cover crop that is feeding that soil biology that Ray and Gabe talked about, feeding my underground livestock. Every one of you, you here has livestock that you farm. There's some of them are underground. Why didn't I just start planting one species or two species or, or three species mixture? Because I listened to the other farmers and people like Gabe and I they already done the they already laid the ground they already know that diversity is, is part of Mother Nature and it should be part of our cropping system. And we don't know what's gonna grow the best. Some species did really good this year, they might not even come up next year, they, they might be a complete failure, but if you hedge your bets a little bit when you plant that diversity, you can, if one species doesn't work out, you got enough in there that the other ones will, will compensate for that. And each one of those species releases a different DNA fingerprint into that soil that feeds a different type of livestock underground. They're, they're each feeding a, a, a different group and they're each feeding them a little bit different food source. We, we waste too much sunlight out here. When you get those different leaf shapes and you get those different heights of plants, you can capture 100% of that solar energy. If you go out and you see sunlight hitting the soil in your fields, then you're wasting too much energy. You need to capture 90 to 100% of that, and these cover crops provide a tremendous way to do that with those with different heights and the different leaf shapes. So here, these are all pictures from my farm, so this just you know, shows the diversity. You know, you can't see any, any soil in there. If you get down and it starts getting tall and, and you crawl under there, under the canopy, you might see a few sunlight specks here and there, but for the most part, all my plants are capturing all that solar energy and putting it in the carbon form and, and feeding my soil. So the top left shows some buckwheat, and that red one's crimson, crimson clover with some radishes in there. Uh, the bottom left, that's, that's one of my main tillage tools right there, it's that radish. You know, how, how, deep, how big a tractor and how deep a, can you go with your, your ripper? You're still, you know, you're only getting maybe a foot into the soil, but some radishes, you know. So, some of them, I've seen just the actual tuber on, on my farm, you get a foot and a half, two foot, and then they got another tap root beyond that. And the same thing looked like the, the sword and sedans, they got a, a huge fibrous root system. And what and if you see on the far right there, that's that's what that's a, that's my tillage pan right there. My all my ground's been farmed previously in a tillage system, you know, for the past 60, 70, 80 years. That's from that sweet plow and that chisel running at three or four inch depth for those many years. It's just created that hard thing. So I need to grow as many roots as possible. I can break through that hard hard pan and I can start utilizing more moisture deeper in my profile and getting more nutrients and providing better habitat for, for my plants and the biology in my soil. You know, so you can't grow cover crops out here because they they use too much moisture, but you, you quit feed, feeding the cows or your sheep because they're drinking water. And you only feed them one thing, just, just a diet of, of corn stalks or the, your, your livestock underground are the same way. They want, they want diversity. It's, it's, we have to look at, it's not dirt, it's a, a biological e e ecosystem. It's alive. And if you don't have a food source out there, your livestock are, are starving. And you know, just from my short farm travels this summer, all my stuff shows that fallow loses more moisture to evaporation than cover crops used for growth. If I, you know, next year, I, I don't know because I don't have any fallow, so I don't be able to test it anymore, so maybe I'll have extra moisture for this one wants to test it. So here, here's another thing. This is post on mallet. Went right into it with another another cover. I stripped that postal mill with the shell board. Didn't spray it or anything, just stripped it, let it dry down, stripped it. Went in with another winter cover. That's down a, a wheel track, so I got all the residue knocked down. You can see 
too. I didn't have any real tracks. I got on that field soon enough that my drill didn't, that straw had enough spring in it that it popped right back up. And you, you couldn't tell it ran the drill through the field either. And that's what those plants are emerging through. Is I'm, I'm getting 90, 100% ground cover. And I got a living root in there. I'm capturing some solar energy even in the winter months. And I'm trying to get rid of those leaks in my system. And I think Ray had a similar slide. 1934 and 2014, and this is still happening. This, this shouldn't be happening. You know, it's, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about this, and, you know, this just makes me mad, I guess, when, when you go to other some of these other conferences and you can see these photos, it's it's embarrassing. It shouldn't be happening. So I commend you all for being here. You've already started to change by being here. I want to drive home, figure out how it can work, what you can do to make it work on your farm. If you understand these principles that Dave and Ray teach, the methods are a thousand. You can do you don't have to do exactly what I do, but if you understand the principles, you understand to give, keep your soil covered, keep a living root in the ground, and feed your soil biology, there's a million ways you can apply it on your farm. And, and some of you may have more innovative things, and, and if we can start this network of people doing this stuff, we can learn from each other. We, you know, in this global economy and global agriculture, we're, we're no longer competing against our neighbors. It's, it's larger scale than that. We need to collaborate and work together to enhance our own area. We need to be, you know, sustainability is one thing, but we're past that point. I think Dave touches on it too. We need to start regenerating our soil instead of mining it. And moisture is relevant out here, but it, it doesn't matter if it rains three inches in an hour, that might be you got three inches in your rain gauge, but maybe a two and a half in a lagoon, a ten acre lagoon in the middle of your field. It's all about how you look at that rain. You know, when, now when people ask me how much rain you get, well, I say, well, my soil got this amount. It's all about how much rain you get into your soil. It, 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 yearly rain totals don't mean anything, and including snowfall, if some of that left left your field and got lost to evaporation or ran, ran into the ditch or, or went away. So. And don't, you know, don't get tunnel vision. Moisture is your only main limiting, that's the only thing you focus on is moisture, moisture, moisture. Well, it's, you got to look at the whole system. It's only, it's only part of it. You got to build that carbon to feed your soil and utilize as much of the sun energy as you can. And if you start doing that, I know I'm going to start seeing my soil be more resilient to drought. And if we do get a three or four inch rain, I can hold all that rain in an hour and I can start building my soils in, in a positive direction. And I'm pretty young, but I'm still thinking about kids coming back or nephews or grandchildren or whatever. I want to, I want to leave them something that they're proud to have and that is, is something that I've generated and is a good soil ecosystem for, for them and they can just take off run, run with it and hopefully you keep the same soil health principles and, and focus on, on regenerating that soil. Education is huge. You know, I started with 20 acres and then went to the whole farm, but I didn't, I didn't just jump in with it with no knowledge base. You know, I went to 20, 30 of these conferences, watched YouTube videos, read as many books as I can. It's all about education. Don't, you know, don't be scared to jump into it, but have a good knowledge base. You search and, and talk to as many people you can and learn as many things as you can. And, and don't be scared, don't be scared to, to start small and then and go big. And the big thing is I'm not going to give up because I know it's going to work and I'm going to make it work and that's where I'm headed. But if something doesn't pan out and, and say you plant a color crop and it, it doesn't work, but you gotta look at the whole system approach and know that it is going to work. So I don't know, are we gonna take any questions or 
These were 10 Australians came out last a week ago on Sunday, I guess, just to, to see my cover crop and, and see what I had going out there on the, on the farm. But, you know, they were out there when it was 10 degrees and, and 30 mile an hour wind was blowing and they were happy, happy as could be for, for a few minutes anyway. I didn't want to go back to the car. But. There's my phone number and email. I'm more than willing to help any of you. You can call me decent hours, I guess. But I will help any one of you if you want to know about what, what things to plan or what things not to plan or when you can plan or, or anything. I'm, I'm more than willing to help any of you if, if you want to accept that. So, I guess if you have any questions, send me your feed. Do we have any questions from your sheet? Oh. Yep. Are you going to consider grazing some crops just before you plant your wheat instead of planting that heavy cover like you did? Yeah, I'm going to. I'm, I'm, see, I'm, I'm just continually evolving. I'm learning how to, how to do things differently. But I have, you know, a, a spring, I'm more of thinking like a spring cover crop graze will help to regrow a little bit and then plant it into one another one season cover crop or the other thing is just I really like finding the green stuff. I'm gonna see what that that leaf does this summer this summer but I'll just have to, to see how it goes. Yeah I need I need to get better with utilizing those covers as a grazing resource to promote not only my soil biology but promote how all of them. Some of the, the question was if I have 25 pounds of cover crop mix. It totally depends on what you're planting. There's such a different variety in seed sizes. I had some peas in there, you know, fairly big seed, and then I got radishes in there. That, you know, full rate of radishes, six pounds an acre. So I'm only planting a half pound or a pound of radishes, and I might be planting 25 pounds of peas. So, I mean, your actual pounds per acre could vary from, you might be putting about 18 pounds. If you're planting bigger seeded species, you might go all the way up to 60, 70, 80 pounds. Oh, my gosh, How heavy did you set your pepper, your drill? Yeah, of course, you set The question was, how did I set my drill for the, the pounds that I was putting down? Um, with that, like in your, in your box drill, you just put the seeds already mixed together, so you Put it in there and you know what your pounds per acre are, so you, you run, run the wheel on your on your box drill and figure out how many pounds you get per acre and then you just calibrate your, your drill for that. So like the air seeder, I just crank it, weigh it, figure out what the rate is and change some transmission settings. And that's the stuff I plant in the wheat when I plant about three quarters of an inch. That's a little shallow for my peas and stuff, and it's a little deep for the radish, but it all you just kind of got to pick a happy, happy meeting. What's your organic? The question was, what is my organic matter now that I'm starting? That one particular field that I've double cover crop, it's already increased a half percent just in this last year. Um, most of my field started out as uh, anywhere from 1.2 to 1.9, but that, that double cover crop field is up to 2.5 already. And it's got the livestock on now, and that field is actually going to another spring cover crop. So it's going to be triple stacked with cover crops, kind of as a, a biological primer to see what what the potential is. What can you do if you really go all that favor? So I'll, I'll be monitoring them over the years, I guess. <laughs> Uh, the question was when I'm going from a spring cover crop to a winter cover crop, what do I spray? Um, that particular field was uh, ground up too far in Bando. The Bando was knocked down quite a bit. This <laughs> didn't affect my um, seeds coming up, but if I see I've changed that and yes. terminated with cattle dogging. But um, 
One of the other things I forgot to mention is if you are planning on putting cover crops into your after wheat harvest this year, you need to pay close attention to your wheat herbicides. The first year I tested it, I had problems with my sorghum and, and the radishes. We got, it got some rain on them, but they just never really took off. And there's a little carryover from some herbicide I sprayed in the spring. So you guys, um, when you look, if you're spraying your winter wheat this spring for weeds and stuff, make sure you use a, a no residual herbicide because it will the question was, has anyone measured those radishes to see what they weigh and see if they're actually gathering more moisture instead of using them? Is that correct? I personally don't know that, I guess. I, I do believe the Keith I know, but they're like 90% water, aren't they? They're pretty high, yeah. yeah. The next thing, just curious. Right now, the question, I, I'm a sharecropper, so how do you deal with your landlords as far as sharing the seed costs or herbicide like that? Right now, I kind of just educated my landowners and kind of show them why I'm doing this on their ground. And at this point in time, I'm paying for 100% of the cover crop seed. But I uh, think eventually down the road, that will change if I just start cutting back on my fertilizer and maybe lose the grain so that will change at this point in time. I'm just saying for that. Yes, sir. I, with, the question was how much raising the cattle. Right now, I'm I'm giving those land. I'm paying for all the cover crop seed. I'm still giving my landlords a third of that revenue from the livestock grade. Okay, let's get done. Thank you.